All right. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the music there. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody to our um, Cal Week session. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight myself. Here we go. Um, uh, yeah, so welcome to our Cal Week session, Barracorn's Berkeley Entrepreneurs, Your Journey Starts Here. And this session is hosted by the Sucharja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, which we call SCET, in case you hear us say that a lot. Um, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm the Academic Program Manager at SCET. And we also have Ken Singer here, um, who is our Chief Learning Officer and Managing Director of the Center. Um, later on, we'll also have, oh, I see we have um, our alumni um, present. His name is Chai Mishra, and he is going to talk about his experience with SCET and um, beyond. So um, we hope that you enjoy this session. Uh, so I do want to just, uh, well, I already introduced everyone. So um, that's kind of the agenda here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about SCET. So you have some idea of um, kind of where we're coming from. And then Ken is going to give a little talk about um, actually entitled Barracorns, Berkeley Entrepreneurs, Your Journey Starts Here. And then Chai will talk about his experience. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions as well. So if you do have questions, um, you can put them in the Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A icon. You're welcome to put a question in there. And we'll either answer it um, in that format, or we might answer it live or ask you to answer it, or sorry, ask it as we answer it live. Um, but know that we'll also have time at the end for questions as well. So that's what we're doing today. So just to get started, again, to give you a little bit of context for um, what SCET is, I do want to mention that um, we are part of, just part of the ecosystem of entrepreneurship and innovation at Berkeley. So if you're interested in entrepreneurship, which I'm guessing you are since you're here today, I encourage you to take a look at this website, begin.berkeley.edu. So be BEGIN stands for Berkeley Gateway to Innovation. And that has, um, it's kind of a compilation of lots of different entrepreneurship and innovation resources on campus. And so it's a really great place to start if you're looking at what um, resources we have to offer here. So again, SCET is just part of that ecosystem, but um, we focus mostly on education. So we offer courses each fall and spring and sometimes summer as well. So if you are coming to Berkeley, definitely take a look at our classes and um, you can see all that information on our website. And we also have a summer abroad program called Global Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, this summer, we're actually offering it as a virtual program, but in the future, we do hope to have it live again um, in Portugal. So that is another cool opportunity through SCET. We also have a certificate in entrepreneurship and technology. Um, and then we also have research opportunities through what we call our X Labs. So things like our alternative meat program. Um, and I do want to mention that all majors are welcome and encouraged to, to participate in our programs and our courses. We, um, we just love having diversity in all different types of ways. So um, different ideas and perspectives can come together to create new ventures. Um, so again, definitely take a look. Our um, URL is down here and that'll get you to all the information I just mentioned. But if you do want to learn more about it, we will be going into more of those topics at our second session um, for Cal Week on Thursday from two to three. And that's called Entrepreneurship Community at Cal. So um, definitely take a look at that and join us on Thursday if you're interested in learning a bit more. Um, so that is a little bit about SCT. And again, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A or ask them at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Singer to give his presentation. Ken? Thanks, Michelle. I'm uh, trying to share my screen here. One second. So can you see my, uh, my slides? Michelle? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so, um, well, well, first of all, congratulations to everyone for getting accepted to Berkeley. It is not easy these days to uh, get accepted. I, I'm a Berkeley alum myself, but when I was applying to schools, it was much easier. Lower SAT scores, I guess you guys don't even have SAT, SATs now, but you have to have unbelievable uh, uh, you, you know, uh, resume of activities that you've been a part of and leaders, leadership roles that you've had. So congratulations for getting accepted. And 
Uh, the presentation I want to give you, I've learned not to oversell Berkeley because I think, you know, Berkeley is an, an amazing place, but is really um, not, you know, it's not the best place for everyone. Uh, it's a, the, one of the best places for entrepreneurs, so I'm going to sell you on that part. But um, for those of you who are looking for an incredible experience to get everything uh, under the sun, it's here. Um, I always start this conversation with those who want to be doctors. Uh, you may want to consider other universities than Berkeley because the grading scale is real here. There's grade deflation. And those of you who really do want to be doctors, uh, there's uh, uh, other universities that are, that are better suited for that. But if you want to be an entrepreneur or an engineer or um, you know, work on projects that can impact the world um, at scale, there's no better place than Berkeley to, to do it. Um, so we, we call this presentation Barracorns because uh, it's a play on the term unicorn and bear. Uh, you, you know, uh, unicorns is a term that we use here in the Valley to talk about companies that are worth a billion dollars. Um, it's kind of a joke. It started out kind of as, as a joke because unicorns don't actually exist as an animal. But um, because they're so rare, these companies to become billion dollar companies, uh, they use that term. And so we've now called our billion dollar companies or, you know, uh, companies that are about to become billion dollar companies, we call them Barracorns. And they come out of Berkeley at, at a fairly regular clip. So a bit about me, uh, I'm the managing director and chief learning officer here. I've been teaching since 2008. I'm a serial entrepreneur, as are most of the instructors in our program. They come from industry. They have started their own companies, uh, many of many companies, many successes, many failures. And uh, we're, we pride ourselves in bringing people from the Silicon Valley and around the world who have had these experiences to come in to teach the students who are in our courses about the real world um, uh, you know, activities and, and lessons and learnings. So um, I have also started my, um, my own, uh, uh, took, well, I, I've started five companies. My last one was a successful exit and, and I've done a lot of fundraising with, uh, with VC. So we, um, our center does a lot of mentoring for companies and, and uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to try to get funding from venture capitalists. Uh, I, like you mentioned earlier, I, I'm an alum. It took me, as if you can do the math here, it took me quite a long time to graduate. I actually quit school twice to do startups and then uh, got to come back. The good thing about Berkeley, uh, it's a public university and has one of those policies that says if you leave school on good terms, uh, you can come back and finish your degree if you would like. Um, I, I ended up uh, you know, finishing out uh, took me a bit of time to do it because I enjoyed both uh, starting companies and Berkeley quite a lot. So I came back to teach. It's it's hard to leave this place once you have come to to spend time here. We are uh, the Sutarta Center, part of the College of Engineering, and our you know our, our mission is pretty uh, pretty broad, but also somewhat specific. We are focusing on education. There are a bunch of other programs and centers on campus that are serving different areas of, of innovation. We try to help primarily undergrads, though we are now working quite a lot with grad students on how to commercialize not only the things that they invent, but also to commercialize themselves. So um, we bring in industry folks, we bring in alums and others who can help in that journey. Our, our group does some research, but primarily teaching and mentoring of, of leadership. And um, we pride ourselves in bringing in just, uh, you know, people who are currently actively working in a startup uh, in venture capital. We try to bring current people into the mix. And so we've had, um, you know, list any company in the Valley right now. We probably have somebody who was either a founder or a core member of that team come and speak to our students in some capacity, whether in our le lecture series or mentoring the students in, in class. So one of the benefits of coming to Berkeley is the name really does attract a lot of amazing people to come into class to work with you, which you wouldn't necessarily get in other universities. We're very central, of course, in the Bay Area. There's so, so much talent that's, uh, that's near here and willing to come in and, and teach. So that is one of the big uh, assets that we have here on this campus. We're the, the flagship program here at Berkeley, we teach over 2000 students. 
not just from Berkeley, but we invite students from around the world to collaborate with the students who attend here to start companies that would have global impact. And that's one of our values here at Berkeley is to not just create you know, a company that would be useful for uh, you know, a couple of people. We want big problems solved. And so we challenge our students to look beyond their own uh, problem set to see if they can impact the world, even as, as young entrepreneurs. We have, I think, the largest selection of courses available for undergrads in entrepreneurship. So before the pandemic, we had 42 classes. That's our magic number. And uh, it ranged from uh, you know, your standard startup classes to product management to venture capital to um, what um, IP, uh, art and entrepreneurship. So we try to uh, create these courses that are going to appeal to students from all over our campus. Even though we're part of the College of Engineering, all of our courses are open to students from every college, every, every department, because we have found that the most sustainable startups are founded by uh, a diverse set of, of skilled entrepreneurs. So someone from engineering, someone from the business school, someone from um, humanities, that that mixing tends to create the best founding teams. So our classes are open to, to everybody. Uh, just some of the numbers here. We are number two in terms of the number of entrepreneurs that have been funded by VCs. This number um, is the undergraduate population. So people who got their undergraduate education at Berkeley or a portion of it, because many of them have dropped out to, to finish creating their company. Uh, 1,300 uh, of, of these companies were founded by Berkeley undergrads, or they, they just got their undergrad at Berkeley. So it could be years later that they started their company. Uh, Berkeley is famous for its uh, semi starting the semiconductor industry. It's kind of, people don't know, one of the first commercial search engines, Inc. to me, came out of research from here. CRISPR technology, uh, Jennifer Dabna, who spoke at one of our classes recently, she won the Nobel Prize on that technology. And we were one of our grads started MySpace as well as Siebel. Uh, Berkeley is known for being having produced a company that has started a space in which uh, a Stanford graduate has dominated the space. So Google taking on the search engine industry and wiping out ink to me. So one of the reasons why we're here as a center is to make sure that doesn't happen again. We want our, our startups to be uh, to grow and to, to dominate markets um, just like Stanford's uh, startups do. We're also really well known for innovating in new spaces like AI, blockchain, alternative meat. Our center has these labs that allow students to become experts in areas so that when they graduate, they have a better shot at getting a, a, a high level career path. So rather than just starting at the beginning, if you are an expert at blockchain, because you know it's so new that anyone can become an expert early on, uh, that lands you into a much higher position at a company uh, that's looking for expertise there. So that's one of our goals is to better prepare you for your career path. And some of our of our alums want to do a bit of a showcase of them. Stephen Lamb, who's in the driver's seat here, he was in our program back in 2009 in our Challenge App course. He graduated. He was actually not an engineer. He's a, he was a business student. He moved back to Hong Kong. And in two years after coming back to Hong Kong, he started GoGo -Go Van. And I think about three years ago, he sold it for over a billion dollars. So that's uh, that's our, our Barracorn here in, in our network. And then there's other companies like Echo that started in 2013. It was a project within my course back then. And they have become a dominant player in telemedicine and got on the cover of Time Magazine. And these students were recent grads. I think they were 22 when they started this company. Then Kimberly, who started uh, Prime Roots with, with Josh in our alternative meat course, I think they've raised tens of millions of dollars at this point. And they started this, uh, this uh, company when they were in one of our classes a few years ago. Uh, Jonathan, who started Farmer's Dog, he was a, one of our alums from 2013. I think he started this company just two years out of college and they are on, they're set to become a billion dollar exit as well. All those companies I've listed are, are set to be billion dollar exits. 
uh, Matt, who started Foresight. It is a mental health care provider, and they are just killing it right now. They have just exploded. They're still cash flow positive and um, headed for a billion dollar exit as well. He started this company, I think, as a junior in, in at, uh, at Berkeley. And then finally on the list here is Chai, who you'll be listening, you'll be hearing from later today. Uh, he was an alum back in 2013. He also started a company that is well on its way to becoming a Barracorn itself. And I'll let him explain what they do and his journey through, through Berkeley. So you don't have to create a billion dollar company coming through our system. Uh, one of the major things that we do is help students recognize what their career paths should be. They sometimes find out that the world of startups just isn't for them. It's too uh, chaotic. It's too uncertain. And so they find that they'd rather go to an established company like Box or, or Google, and that's fine. But they've picked up the skills of being able to work in a tech environment, and they end up climbing the ladder faster in these tech companies that they go to. So why is uh so how is berkeley's program different from those you'll see at other universities some of you might be considering the school down down the road you might be considering east coast uh maybe you want to be an entrepreneur and you're thinking babson because it's a business school i'd like to make the argument that entrepreneurship is not a business activity it's not about managing business that's what most business schools focus on because they most of their graduates go off to banking or consulting or some established business that needs those skills that they've developed. I would argue that entrepreneurship is actually an engineering uh, skill because what you're doing is you're creating something, something brand new. And that's what uh, engineers do. They create things. Uh, they are in the creative arts. It's yes, math and science, but they are creating something new. And so the skills of uh, and the mindset of an engineer really translate well into entrepreneurship. And uh, and so we take that approach. We look for um, teaching in a very different way. Uh, and when we teach, the, the question that I typically get is, how do you teach innovation? How do you teach entrepreneurship? And I say that it's probably the wrong question to ask. It's not a question of whether you can teach it. It's a matter of whether you can learn it. Um, it's like, I joke, it's like multivariable calculus. Um, it's not a matter of if the teacher is great, it's whether the student is paying attention or is teaching themselves. And one of the, one of the, eh, I don't know how to describe this, but one of the things that Berkeley does well is forcing its students to learn how to learn. You have to teach yourself many things. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur or even a computer scientist, you're going to have to teach yourself new things when there are no teachers around uh, because it's brand new. There are no teachers, right? Or you're learning someone else's code and that person's no longer at the company. So you have to learn how to teach yourself. And that's really what we do at our center is try to teach that skill. If you guys know this animal, and I, I usually do this presentation when there's live people in front of me and with Zoom, it's bad, but this uh, one directional Zoom is worse because I can't see anyone's faces. So I could just be talking into the ether. So uh, I, I usually ask people, hey, what is this animal? But I'm just gonna have a conversation with myself here. This is a crow, this is a raven. And what um, the reason I bring this up is they're incredibly, uh, they're known for one really incredible thing, and that is that they're extremely smart. Um, they are known for their ability to use tools. And this bird has the ability to use these little sticks to you know, pull food out of crevices. They use tools. But what's more fascinating is this animal has been observed making tools. They can be taught how to make tools and it can synthesize this, this skill so that they can be given a task like this, which is to take, to try to get the food in this clear box. It can't reach that food with its beak, so it has to use a stick to get it. It, it gets the small stick off the string, but the stick is too small to get to that food. So it uses the small stick to pull the long stick out of this contraption so it can use the long stick to get the food. Now, this whole explanation is so complex, I probably lost some of you in trying to explain this, but this bird can do this 
having been taught the skills of having to solve its problems. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, this skill of making their own tools, despite my students at Berkeley being extremely smart and, and well-read, many of them cannot do this. They cannot make their own tools. And that's primarily because they have been taught through their entire education deductively. That is, they've been given every formula, every explanation, every instruction set to be able to do their work, right? And then they're asked to practice over and over and over. And then we ask them, hey, how much of this do you remember? And we give those who can remember the most an A, and we tell everybody else, hey, you're, you're not as smart. This is what we call deductive education, and it's not really, you know, for, for entrepreneurs, this doesn't really work. Um, and this is actually not how our brains are wired. Our brains are wired for inductive learning. And that is this. This is you look at something, you see something happen, you see a result, and you ask why. This is what five-year-olds do, constantly asking the question, why, why this, why that? Is this because they're observing things and they're wiring their brain by, look, by trying to find a causation? And we've taken that out of education. We just tell people, just learn what we tell you to learn and just regurgitate back when we ask you to. And that has really made it difficult to teach entrepreneurship because our students are expecting a, a student experience. Students have been trained to be the exact opposite, right? So students, when it comes to risk reward, um, they don't want to look dumb, so they don't want to take risks. But with a startup, you have to risk being wrong. With culture, students have this culture of perfection. If I don't get 100 on this test, I'm not going to get into Berkeley, right? But with a startup, you have to have a culture of just good enough. Right. If you wait for perfect, Google will kill you because they have a thousand engineers working on the same problem. So you just can't wait for perfect. In terms of collaboration, students, um, you know, the smart ones are known to just have the answer. They don't need to ask. But in startups, there might not be an answer. So you have to learn how to ask for help and ask for, for those to, to give you um, insight into finding the answer. And it, the list goes on. Students, they're tested individually. But in startups, it doesn't matter if you get your work done. If the entire team, or if your sales uh, person can't sell it, then your entire team fails. So it's, a, it's constantly a group effort. It's not individually um, assessed. Everyone is a competitor in a student mindset because you are on a curve. In startup land, everyone is a resource, even your competitors. It's important to know who your competitors are because they help you. So student mindset, it's zero sum, right? It's uh, I win, you lose, you win, I lose. But in startup land, it's a creative. We're all trying to figure out how to get, you know, build a business to get customers. And so if you've been trained as a student to be a really good A plus student, um, you will fail to be a good entrepreneur if you don't understand that the things that you've been trained on, the way to look at the world has to shift into something different in order for you to succeed. And so that's what we have been focusing on is trying to trans, and I know this is ironic, this is kind of how we are right now, I'm talking at you and I apologize because it's the only way we can do this right now. But we have looked at the way that, that uh, traditional education has been done, this transfer of knowledge where we tell you how things work and we just tell you, here's the formula, here is the canvas, and then say, here, fill all this out, and maybe this will look like a business. We realize this doesn't work. Our students, if they were to do this, they, they might get an A, but they're not starting companies. So what we've done is we flipped the model, and we've called it the Berkeley Method, and that is focusing on an environment, creating an environment for self-learning. This is where Berkeley excels because our classes move so quickly, you know, the, the, there are large courses and you just have to learn how to figure things out, how to excel in different departments and different classes. You end up teaching yourself how to learn. And that's really what entrepreneurs do is they're teaching themselves how to learn. So we've guided students through this discovery process on how things work. We help them find ways to apply these lessons 
and we help them with what would be behavioral training, how to meet new people, how to interview customers, uh, how to manage your own team. But these are all behaviors. These are habits that we help uh, develop, muscle memory. So we have to change the way we teach away from this very deductive, here are rules, here are the ways to do things, and roll it back to the time that you were asking the question why. Like I was talking about that five-year-old, that's literally what we do is to roll it back to when you were five and you played games and you learned through games. So you learned how to share, you learned how to take turns, you learned strategy, you learned collaboration, you learned all of these things through the joy of games. And so we've reintroduced these concepts in teaching entrepreneurship through puzzles, social games, uh, industry challenges to, to incite that desire and curiosity uh, to learn and to self-learn. And the way we do that in the classroom is we've designed classes around this model of challenge lab or industry collider in which we bring industry into the classroom to challenge students. And these real world challenge courses have themes. So it can be like declassification, one of our more popular courses or classes on how to innovate during the pandemic or sustainability. And then we also introduce tech, new technologies like AI, big data, AR, VR, alternative meat, and challenge students to innovate in these technology spaces, solving problems in these social issues like declassify or pandemic. Many of these courses are sponsored by companies who are interested in seeing solutions in these spaces, but they're also interested in, in finding great talent. So this becomes also a, a career builder. For, for many people. And in these challenges, students have to build real companies, real products, and they have a competition at the end. And the winning teams receive startup acceleration. And some of those teams that you saw in that list uh, went through that journey. So this is real. These are all things that happen while you are a student here if you choose to take on this journey. Uh, last thing I want to leave you with, because I'm running out of time, is one of our most important um, elements is the global um, perspective. We want our students to be global citizens. So it's not enough just to live in the Silicon Valley because the Valley is really just, it's actually more than 50% immigrants. Uh, people from India, China, Korea, France, Germany, who are all there to innovate. And so we want our students to go out into the world and see it. And there's something about being, uh, you know, study abroad or being in another country that feels like being an immigrant. Uh, that helps you see opportunities you might not have seen if you were just to stay at home. So we encourage students to participate in our programs that send you abroad. So some of these challenge labs, they have a trip at the end. The winning teams can go to places like Barcelona, where they can compete in um, a global competition. Uh, we also encourage them to do our study abroad, which uh, th this, uh, well, it's, it's Weirdly, this is remote this, this summer. It's a weirdly study at home, but abroad. But after this summer, it's going to be a study abroad in Portugal. Uh, we've had that in Portugal for the last few years. And just uh, this because it's my favorite program that we do, it's uh, incredibly powerful, powerful for the students who go through this because they, not only do they get credits from the engineering school from our program, but they get to collaborate with 400 students from around the world to start companies. So 80 startups emerge out of this experience and you do it all um, uh, you know, on the beaches of Portugal. And I'll give you some pictures here. This is what you do during the day, during the weekdays, you work on your projects and you pitch. And then uh, on the weekends you go and see uh, the Mediterranean. So it is play hard, work hard, or the reverse order, work hard, then play hard. And, um, but you learn enormous amounts from being able to work with people around the world. Uh, Michelle, how much time do I have left? Did I go, I went really fast, but I wanted to give Chai as much time as possible. Do I have? Um, we have time now for a couple of questions, but if you want to, if you still have a little bit to go, you can take a couple minutes. Sure, well, uh, let's do some questions. Okay, great. Um, someone typed a question. Uh, what is the best major to take for entrepreneurship? Oh, ah, I don't. Let me just tell you my favorite majors right now. 
Uh, so I was a I was a history major here at Berkeley, and um, and I am not a lawyer, which is kind of the 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 trajectory of many history majors at Berkeley is that you get your history major and degree and then go to law school. I was one of those that uh, didn't do that. Um, I loved that department. I loved the, the stuff that I learned there. But if I were to do this again, there are a couple other majors that I would look at. One is the number one would be cognitive science because it is such a universal topic. You learn not only the psychology component, but you also learn the biology part of the brain. And if you have been noticing, everyone's talking about AI. And AI is trying to create you know, the same effects at, in a computer as the brain, the human brain. So you end up start studying a lot of stuff that would be very, very relevant for someone who wanted to go into technology in the next 10 years. So I think that's the most relevant, most powerful uh, degree right now. Uh, I think one underappreciated degree is rhetoric because you learn how to make arguments. You learn how to um, you know, think and, and, and come up with uh, solid logic. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you need all of those skills if you want to convince an investor to invest in you. So a lot of the de departments that teach you soft skills, those are, I think, highly underappreciated and incredibly valuable if you want to go into tech. Also, data science is, of course, uh, the hot topic, very, very well worth the time. Um, and a lot of students are doing dual majors between data science and something else, which is something that I would highly recommend doing. There's some more questions here. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions, but I actually do want to make sure that Chai gets to speak as well. Yeah, so I'll hit these really fast. My favorite companies that come out of Berkeley, I'm going to say Chai's company because Chai is here and he was one of my students. Um, of course, all the students who came out of my, my classes themselves were all those on that list are my favorite companies. Uh, uh, let's see, how competitive are these startup opportunities? Uh, all of those companies were started by stu current students or had graduated in the last two years, and they're all headed towards billion dollar exits. Um, uh, those are those are real. Um, let's see, I recently got admitted to Haas. Congratulations. Uh, we do see a lot of Haas students. We do try to keep a balance because uh, we offer more entrepreneurship courses uh, than Haas does, and we just want to make sure there's a balance. Come talk to me, actually, if you're interested in taking our courses because we'll, we'll need to talk. Um, our door is always open. That's one of the things uh, that's unique about us is that we're here really to try to serve the, the students. And we're very serious about that. So come, come see us. Don't be afraid of, of uh, you know, reaching out. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to you, Michelle. I can answer these by typing while Chai starts uh, his session. That sounds good. Great. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? And Chai, would you like to turn on your camera and share your screen? Absolutely. Um, let's just do a quick test, make sure that you guys can actually see my both my screen and my camera. Um, so, Michelle, how am I doing? Can you see everything? Let me go ahead and replace. Oh, there you are. Great. Hey, everybody. Um, am I good to get started? Yes, please. All right, let's do it. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ken, um, for saying that we're one of your favorite companies. Um, I'll take it, even though I know you said it, half of it was because I'm here, but I'll take it still. Um, I, I should also say, I'm not just saying this because he's here. Uh, I love Ken. Uh, Ken is one of the best teachers I've ever had. Uh, I think probably the best teacher I've ever had. And he's been a mentor to me uh, for a very long time. So naturally, I was very, very happy and proud to do this when Ken asked me. Um, a little background on me. My name, as you can see, is Chai Mishra. I am 26 years old. and I'm the founder of a company called Move. Move is e-commerce 2.0. That's how we think of ourselves. We think that traditional e-commerce uh, isn't really good enough. And we think that it is inefficient and it is unethical at times, um, so we're making a better version of it. How we do that is we work with award-winning producers, 
for every single product in the world. And we sell their products under our own brand with no markup. And by cutting out the middleman, by cutting out the markups, the brands, uh, we could take these very premium products and uh, we can make them dramatically more affordable. But we can also make the supply chain behind these products way more ethical. Um, when they, when somebody spends ten dollars with us, we show them exactly where every single dollar went. Um, we can pay producers more through this model. Um, so the idea is to build a version of e-commerce that is more efficient than Amazon and is more ethical than Amazon. So anyway, that's what I do. But today I have been asked uh, to talk to you about how Berkeley can help you become an entrepreneur, uh, which is a funny thing. It's a little bit like being asked uh, by the Catholic Church to tell you how the Catholic Church can help you become an atheist. Um, uh, it's, it's an odd thing in more ways than one. The point is, becoming an entrepreneur isn't like becoming a doctor or a lawyer. Higher education, as Ken said, isn't really built to produce entrepreneurs. There just isn't a straight line. There isn't a major you can take in entrepreneurship, at least one that matters. Certificates, awards, GPAs, none of these things can guarantee you success as a founder like they can in other places. Once you're a doctor, you're a doctor and somebody could write it on a piece of paper. It's not really true for entrepreneurship. So that begs the question, uh, what in the world do I say to you today? After a lot of thought, I decided that today I would just tell you about my life because nine years ago, uh, I was 17 years old. And I was at my own Cal Day, um, excited, bubbling with energy, um, waiting to start my first semester at Berkeley. And then I blinked and all of a sudden, now I'm 26 years old and I'm a working entrepreneur. That's how I pay my own bills. And that's how I'm fortunate to be able to help a bunch of other people pay their bills. Um, so what in the hell happened while I was blinking is a real question. Um, and I figured that the best way to do it was just to walk you through my decade in America, my ne near decade in America, and just let you decide. And again, it's hard to, to construct any kind of lessons out of any of this stuff. So I figured I would just tell you my three top takeaways um, from my decade in America. Um, so let's get started. Um, those are the only two topics I'm going to cover today, by the way. And after that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I came to Berkeley and to America, as I said, with my grandfather in 2012. My grandfather, just as a sidebar, was the most important person in my life, uh, and he was my role model. Um, my entire life, people told me I look like him, people had told me that I acted like him, and in his own life, he had overcome immense poverty and, and, and hardship uh, to become a mechanical engineer an entire half a century before I did. Um, so when I decided that I was going to study mechanical engineering, he made these two bold proclamations. Number one, he said that he would pay for everything. No one was allowed to give me a dime. He would pay for everything. And number two, he said that no one was allowed to take me to Berkeley, that he at 82 years old would be the only person that would come with me from India all the way to Berkeley. So that's what we did on July 31st, 2012. I still remember. We flew into the, uh, the barren terrain of San Francisco, into that very dry looking airport. And uh, I came to Berkeley. Um, coming to Berkeley, I truly, if you can believe this, sounds like a, uh, an entire uh, era ago, but I had no idea what a technology entrepreneur was. Um, in 2012, I had three goals in life. I wanted to become a mechanical engineer, like my grandfather. Uh, one time in my life, I wanted to be on some kind of big list, like a Time 100 list or like a Forbes list or something like that. And finally, and this is completely true, uh, I just wanted to make enough money as a mechanical engineer uh, to one day be able to buy a cherry red Mercedes C-Class convertible. Those were my, that was the sum total of all of my desires in life, was become a mechanical engineer, end up on some kind of list. Uh, from Forbes or Time Magazine and buy a cherry red Mercedes. Um, in 2013, um, a friend told me about this summer abroad program that Berkeley was hosting. Um, it was this month long startup accelerator in Estonia taught by this professor named Ken Singer. Uh, it sounded fun. I'd never been to Estonia or to Eastern Europe before, so I signed up. That was about as much thought as I put into it. 
And that summer I was introduced by Ken to the idea of technology entrepreneurship. Um, I was instantly smitten. Um, I just couldn't believe then uh, at 19 years old that anyone could make a living coming up with ideas and then working on those ideas day and night. And just that that could be a lifestyle, that could be a way to pay the bills was an insane thing to me. Um, to this day, it's unbelievable to me that I get to do that, that I'm so lucky to be able to do that. Um, anyway, uh, I did the program over the summer and I returned to Berkeley uh, just a few days before the, the fall semester began. And uh, I still hadn't really m decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just, um, it seemed like a crazy thing to decide to do. It's like deciding to win the lottery. It just didn't make a lot of sense to me. So generally my, my plan was pretty unchanged. Um, I wanted to become a mechanical engineer. Maybe one day go out and get an MBA. I'm sure a lot of you would have similar um, dreams. Become an engineer, go out and get an MBA one day, and then maybe uh, one day get a cherry red Mercedes. Um, so that was my, that, again, that's who I was in 2013 after I came back from Estonia with Ken. Uh, and the night before classes started um, in 2013, my, my what, would be, what would have been my second year at Berkeley, I got a call from my dad. And he told me that my grandfather had passed on. And uh, he asked me to take the next flight home. Uh, I was devastated, as you can imagine. Um, by the time I got back to Berkeley from his funeral, uh, I could barely pull together the energy to get out of bed, and let alone go to class. Um, by 2014, my uh, GPA had gone from a 3.8 to a 2.7. My attendance record did not exist. Um, it was still up for question whether or not I was actually a student at Berkeley. Um, I was put on academic probation. Yeah, it, obviously, I was spiraling. Um, and worst of all, with my grandfather gone, um, I was now without a compass. I just, I mean, without him there, without his example, of mechanical engineer, I felt pretty directionless, uh, completely directionless. Um, I no longer knew why or if I would even want to be an engineer. Um, and by the time the summer rolled around I, and I began looking for work, uh, the only industry I knew I was interested in were startups. Fortunately, my grades were so horrific that nobody was gonna be hiring me as an engineer anyway. So I just worked after me. Um, the only job that I was both interested in and could get into was in China. Uh, and uh, this, this Berkeley alum had started a company out there to help American startups uh, get their products manufactured. Uh, and they just needed a project manager. They just needed somebody that spoke uh, English. Um, so I jumped on it. I was 19 years old, not speaking a word of Mandarin. And I moved to China and I began working for startups every single day. Um, I, for the second time in my life since, since leaving home, I knew I was at the right place. Working with startups, it just, my, my world grew in size. I just couldn't believe how fantastic it was. Um, by 2015, one of the startups I'd worked with in China asked me to come and work for them full-time in Berlin. This girl, who's on screen right now, um, this girl that I'd fallen in love with at Berkeley uh, was going to be doing a summer abroad in Sweden and wanting to both work for an exciting startup and just wanting to be close to her. Um, I gave Berkeley leave of absence and I moved to Berlin uh, at the time I was 20 years old. And my job in Berlin was to build a fairer supply chain for coffee. I absolutely loved it. Um, I was fascinated by the process of how products get made, how they end up on shelves, how they end up in people's uh, houses, um, how they're brought to us. Every single step of the supply chain, I was just blown away by it. And I just thought it was the most beautiful, fun thing ever. Um, I used to work every single day, uh, seven days a week, I would work from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. because I wanted to. Nobody else at the company was working that hard, but I was so in love with this work, the work of supply chain, I just, I just couldn't get enough. Um, and by 2016, I felt like I found a new direction. I wanted to start a company that would fundamentally change the process by which products were getting made and how they were getting brought to people. That's what I was interested in. And so I moved back to America uh, and I made my leave of absence with Berkeley permanent. I dropped out of Berkeley in 2016 and I started working full time on what would eventually become Ooh. Um, I also pulled in two more 
uh, Berkeley friends who were on screen. Um, it was just two guys I'd met randomly at a cafe somewhere in Berkeley. Uh, and together we started working on this company out of my living room, just north of campus. Um, all of our first customers were Berkeley students. When we needed mentorship, I would just email. I would literally go to Wikipedia and look at every single Berkeley alum that had a Wikipedia page and I would find their emails and I would reach out to them. Um, or on days when I was feeling a little lazier or I really needed help, um, I would just um, pedal over to uh, Ken at the CET and I would just spend an afternoon um, getting advice from him. Um, I wasn't even a student uh, when I was doing this and Ken would still see me, one of the many reasons I love Ken. Um, and by early 2017, we had some traction. Uh, after being rejected by literally every single campus uh, accelerator. Uh, here, here's a list of accelerators that rejected us at Berkeley. It, is, it overlaps 100% with the list of accelerators at Berkeley. That's who rejected us. Uh, after being rejected by every single campus accelerator and incubator, we were accepted into Y Combinator, uh, the world's most prestigious um, startup investor. They've funded Airbnb, Dropbox, Coinbase. These were all companies that came out of Y Combinator. Um, being in YC allowed us to get an office in San Francisco, uh, to build a small team, to raise our first full round of funding. 22 years old, five years after coming to America, um, and four years since losing my grandfather, uh, I felt for the very first time like I was going somewhere, like I was actually doing something of value. Uh, of course, if you picked up on the trend, that feeling evaporated pretty quickly. Um, because by mid-2018, we were out of money. Uh, the first iteration of Move had not worked. Uh, it had turned out to be far costlier than, to start than I thought. And due to the lack of money and the lack of momentum, my team quit. I was back working alone, um, at first in an office that was meant for way more people, just that would show up alone to an office for 20 people and I'd work out of there alone. Um, I was depressed. And I felt like a complete failure. I felt like I just burned through my investors' money and I had let down my entire team that had taken this chance on me. Um, but, but I still had faith in the concept. Um, I was convinced that we just needed to try a different, leaner approach. And by God, was it lean, as you can see on the screen. So I lost the office and um, I started working out of my living room and sometimes out on the street. Um, uh, and without the pressure of having to manage people and without having any expectations to live up to because I had already um, let everybody down, or at least it felt like it, I was just able to focus on what I loved, which is the work of being an entrepreneur, the day-to-day -day of starting a company. Um, to this day, this was the most productive creative phase I've, I've had in my life. Um, and I was right. By 2019, we were back. Uh, we introduced the concept to market in late 2019, and uh, people loved it. We sold over a million dollars of membership to the store uh, just in pre-orders in the very first month uh, when we opened up. Uh, Forbes even wrote an article about me that's on the screen. Uh, the headline began with the words hubris question um, mark. That part hurt, obviously, uh, but I took it in stride. I, um, yeah, I just, just felt a little sassier than it needed to be. But that's, that's what 2019 was like for us. Uh, and by early 2020, uh, we launched just uh, two weeks before the pandemic hit America. Uh, instantly, our supply chain was shut down. This is early 2020, if you think back to March of last year. Um, suppliers couldn't enter their facilities. Couriers like UPS, FedEx, they couldn't deliver on time. Um, customers began hoarding. Investors stopped writing checks. We were running out of money. But the concept worked. The, 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 every brick that we had laid down, me and my lovely team working out of my living room and out on the street, um, it worked. The concept worked. Um, all throughout, our customers stayed very loyal. Um, our customers spent twice as much money with us every year uh, as they do with Amazon. Uh, and later in 2020, when, um, um, when we launched this campaign to let the public invest and move, um, our customers put in over a million dollars into the company um, and they kept us alive all through 2020. By the end of the year, we, 
I, it, was, it was pretty clear. It was palpable that we had made it through the woods. We were uh, out of the tunnel. Uh, we had money in the bank, customers that loved us, and Forbes even put me on their, four, on their 30 under 30 list last year, which I was very grateful for. Um, the write-up this time was much, um, wasn't as sassy. I appreciated that. Uh, they changed their tone. I, it didn't seem like hubris all of a sudden, so that was cool. Um, and then now it's 2021. Um, we're getting out of the pandemic. We all are. It, has, it is time for me to decide where I want to plant the company. Um, and I decided that I want us to be a Berkeley-based company. Uh, I moved back just about a month ago and I'm moving the company back. We are setting up our headquarters just about a few blocks from campus. Um, during my weeks, I work with this beautiful team of people all over the country. We're up to 20 people now, um, all over the United States and, and a couple of people abroad. Uh, and we have some of the greatest investors in the world, everyone from Y Combinator to the San Francisco 49ers to Joe Montana. You all are way too young to know who that is, but um, some, uh, some actors, musicians, um, everyone from a Grammy winning uh, musician um, to award-winning actors and the founders of companies like Caviar and Home24, these are all investors in the company. Um, and so that's what I do during my weeks. And on my weekends, I talk to Berkeley students who are trying to start their own companies. Um, I've asked Ken to just send as many to me as, uh, as he has. And that's my life. Um, that's what I do for a living. Um, now, as you can tell, it's hard to squeeze any kind of uh, juice out of that. Um, what do you make of a story like that? So here's what I did. I'm just going to tell you three things as an aspiring entrepreneur um, that I feel confident saying. Uh, these are things that I think are fairly non-subjective. Um, number one, the roads are not paved. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, there's this great joke I heard recently. It's uh, this comedian was talking about um, how when his immigrant grandfather moved to America, somebody told him uh, that the roads were paved with gold in America. And when his grandfather got here, he learned three things. First, the roads are not paved with gold. Second, the roads are not paved. And third, he would be the one paving them. And that's a little bit what being an entrepreneur is like. The roads are not paved. You need to define not only what a successful state looks like, you need to define what the path there is. You need to redefine and reassess every single step of the way. If you think that you can come to Berkeley and sign up with an, even an amazing organization like the CET, uh, or just take a major and that that will then shoot you out as an entrepreneur, you are wrong. You are not, if it was that easy, way more people would do it. The roads are not paved. Second, life will not go as planned. And that's okay. And actually, you know what? The only thing I can say today with 100% certainty to you is that your life in the next decade will not go how you think it's going to go. That's actually the only way it will not go is exactly how you planned. Um, I thought right now um, that I would be a mechanical engineer and that I would have a cherry red Mercedes. Um, I do not have a mechanical engineering degree and I do not have a chariot in Mercedes. The Mercedes is less due to lack of money. It's more because I gained at least a little bit of a modicum of taste. So that's why I didn't get it. But um, neither of those two things worked out for me. And those were, that was two thirds of my plan for coming to America and for going to Berkeley. But I did end up on the Forbes list. Um, life can take, life can snake through and um, you don't predict it. You, you can't predict it. You can't tell how it's going to go. Life flips and changes constantly and uh, you end up in places you might not expect, but that's what makes life beautiful. That's what makes entrepreneurship beautiful. It is just so existential. So, Tom, um, so, mm -hmm. Tom, so that last point where you talk about the find the right soil, that right soil was Berkeley for you. I mean, even so that yeah. you're coming back to set up your office is finally after the pandemic to br bring it home. So yeah. you know, as we come to the top of the hour here, um, I think that's that. I think that's a powerful message: is that you yeah. have to find the right soil. So those of, of the students who are here in attendance who are choosing between Berkeley and MIT, or Berkeley and UCLA, or you know wherever. Um, you know, what, what would you say is the best case you can make for an, entre an entrepreneurial student? Why to choose mm -hmm. Berkeley? Yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it um, around that point exactly. Um, you need to find the right soil. 
as an intelligent 18 year old or 19 year old, however old you all are, um, you have everything you need to be successful. It is inside of you. Um, the seed of success, so to speak, is inside of you. Plant yourself in the right place. What you need to surround yourself with to become an entrepreneur, given that you have the, the seed of success is you want to surround yourself with smart people who will quit school and come and work on your startup when nobody else will do it. You want smart people to do that. You want to surround yourself with professors uh, that will fight for you when you get put on academic probation like I did and will fight to keep you in school because they understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur. That's what Ken did for me. Um, you want to surround yourself with founders who will move back and give you advice just because they went to the same school as you. Come to Berkeley. It is, uh, you have everything you need to be successful. You just need to be in the right place. You just need to be around the right people. Uh, no part of my success, if you go back and just listen to this, hopefully a recording will be released. Uh, you can call out about 75 different points in that story where it makes no sense. Uh, and it would have never happened if I hadn't gone to Berkeley. Just think about this. I was 18 years old when I dropped out for the first time and somebody gave me a job. I had no discernible skills. They didn't do it because I'm a particularly char charming person. I'm not. They did it because I was a student at Berkeley and they assumed that must mean something. Um, that was a Berkeley alum that gave me that job. Over and over and over, I was afforded opportunities and things worked for me because I had gone to Berkeley. Um, had I gone to another school that didn't understand entrepreneurship, but didn't have such a culture, an electric culture of entrepreneurship, none of that would have ever happened. So uh, you have everything you need to be successful. You just need to be in the right place. And to my knowledge, there is no better place than Berkeley to be an entrepreneur, which is why I've moved my company back here. Um, come to Berkeley. You're going to like it. That's all I got. Thank you. Hi, that was that was great. Thank you for that. And for for someone like me who's an instructor, um, it's amazing to see my students go off to do great things. Is what why I'm in my role today, but also to see that they come back and pay it forward to the next generation. And and he may be a mentor for you as you develop your own startups. The for the parents who are on this call, because I know some of you are here watching over the shoulder of your child. Um, Students do graduate from Berkeley. They don't all drop out. I know that there was a constant theme here of find a great idea, find your team, and then drop out of school. That does happen once in a while, and uh, and there's great outcomes like Chai. Um, I had a great experience, but they also come back and finish like like I did. And so maybe someday I will be pushing Chai to to finish. Uh, maybe do the Steve Wozniak kind of thing and come back when you're 50 and, and get your degree. But uh, it's not needed because he's well on his way. I'm going to hand it over to Michelle because I think she's going to wrap up this session because there are there's more programming for you if you are interested in learning more about our center. And I think Michelle can give you that information now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Chai. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, so I put a few links in the chat just to, to make sure you all have that. Again, um, we do have another session on Thursday from two to three called Entrepreneurship Community at Cal. So if you are interested in learning more about SCET and what we have to offer, please do join us then. Um, that will be recorded as well as this session today and we'll post that on our website under our student section. So if you don't have time to join us then, you can watch it later. Um, I also put something in the chat to invite you to our Collider Cup, which is um, coming up on May 7th. So if you're interested in watching our top teams from this semester compete, you can get some insight into, into what we're doing in our classes then. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. I think I put my email in the chat as well. And um, we look forward to seeing you all um, at Cal in the fall. Thank you, everyone.